is sometimes when we think about Alzheimer's, it can be very confusing, lots of big words, and I have to say Jonathan is adept at bringing some very complicated information down to the public's level, my level, um, and understanding. So I really hope you enjoy him as much as we all have been doing. And thank you so much, Jonathan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Uh, I'm really glad to be up here in the switch. Uh, I usually come up here a few times every summer, uh, and then I come again in the fall for apple picking, so it's, it's lovely to actually meet the community. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the brain aging and memory loss. Uh, and so I'm going to speak for hopefully uh, maybe about 30 to 40 minutes, and then I'd like to give over the rest of the time uh, to just do a question and answer period, so that I can answer your questions, uh, your concerns uh, about your thinking and memory abilities uh, as you're getting older. But hopefully, uh, I'll answer a lot of the questions along the way. Um, just wanted to say that I, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I don't uh, work for any pharmaceutical companies. And uh, Partners Healthcare does not pay me enough to lie. So uh, everything that uh, I tell you here I, is, is definitely my own opinion. Um, uh, at least as uh, close to my understanding of the literature as I can come. Uh, so there are three things that I'd like to talk to you about today, over the next uh, 30, 35 minutes or so. First, uh, we're going to talk about how memory works, because it seems like that might feel very simple, but in reality it's a very complicated thing. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, how memory uh, can be found in the brain, and then we'll talk about how both of those systems, memory and the brain, change as you get older. And all of that's really just considering uh, healthy aging. Then we're going to talk about the A word, that big scarlet A, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and we'll talk about what that looks like in the brain and how that affects your behavior. And then finally, I'm going to leave you uh, with uh, some positive notes. So I'm going to tell you about the latest findings in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is all uh, discoveries and breakthroughs that have occurred just in the year 2015. Uh, some of this stuff is as recent as um, late last week. So there's new stuff happening all the time with Alzheimer's disease. And hopefully I can walk you through uh, some of the new stuff that, that's coming down uh, the pipeline. So let's go ahead and start by talking about memory, how memory works. So uh, when you imagine how memory works, uh, how many of you sort of imagine something like a video camera in your head, like a little, maybe a video recorder, and uh, if I ask you what you were doing, say, two weeks ago, you hit rewind until you get to two weeks ago, and then you hit play, and you're saying, oh, okay, I guess I was you know, visiting my nephews. Um, I, I think even I started off uh, thinking of memory in, in precisely this way, but it is wrong. As compelling and as intuitive an example of memory uh, that might seem, that's not actually how memory works at all. Uh, about 125 years of research uh, have told us at least that much. Uh, in reality, memory is a very complex uh, composite of many processes that have to work together in just the right way uh, for your memory to work at all. And so in reality, uh, a lot of us complain about how our memory isn't what it used to be, but the, truthfully, it's a minor miracle that it even works right at all. Uh, so today we have about four distinct stages of memory. And uh, keep in mind, you don't actually have to remember what the four stages are. But what I want to emphasize is that, they, that there are several stages that all have to work together in concert. And I'll just run through them really briefly. First, you have to have an attentional phase of memory. Uh, you have to be paying attention to uh, something. And when you pay attention to something, that means you have to not pay attention to something else. Uh, so this is actually what I study in particular, and so um, uh, what I know is that hopefully you're all paying attention to my face and my voice. Uh, the reality is that since I study mind wandering, I know that you guys are going to be gone about a third of the time. That's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, attention is important because not because of what we're paying attention to, but what we're ignoring. So for example, hopefully you're listening to me. But at the same time, you're probably not quite aware of how your right knee feels in your jeans or your pants until I said something. You've been ignoring that until I brought it to your attention. 
And so now you're paying attention to that and not to me, so come back, come back. Um, <laughs> attention is a process by which we constrain the information from, of the world around us to something that is easily digestible and something, hopefully, that we can remember. And the way that we do that is by going into step two, stage two, which is encoding. And that's the process by which we just get stuff in our brain. The way that we lay down a pattern of neurons, a pattern of brain cells that fire in such a way that we can come back, recreate that firing pattern, and uh, then remember something. The third stage of memory is the one that we know the least about, and it is probably the hottest area of research today, um, and that's storage. Uh, those of you who follow a lot of neuroscience news might have uh, read recent research on sleep or consolidation, as it sometimes is known. But this is the process um, of understanding how the memories uh, just stick in our heads. So, for example, uh, you don't have every memory that's just at your fingertips. Um, but if I say, what were you doing in the summer of 1987, suddenly you, you kind of know. But where, where, where was that memory before I asked that question? That's the deep question that we're trying to answer by understanding more about the storage phase of memory. It's a, it's a lot of questions right now. We don't have too many answers. Finally, retrieval is, just, is, the, is really the fun part of memory or the frustrating part. It's when you've got the stuff, you know it's in your head, and you get it out, or you fail to get it out. So, um, retrieval is a really interesting process because what we've learned about retrieval over the intervening years uh, is not that our memories fade, per se. It's not that it leaves our head, but rather there's a lot of noise. Uh, we have come to believe that rather than there being a decay model of memory, where the information just sort of goes away, there's an interference model of memory, where it just gets jumbled up with a lot of other information so that we can't easily distinguish it. So, take heart. If there's something that you just can't remember, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> we just have to find the right kinds of triggers to, to bring it back. So, Again, you don't have to remember all of that, all of those four stages of memory, but just keep in mind that each of those stages, attention, encoding, storage, retrieval, they all have to work together, and they all have to work together in perfect synchrony for you to have the sensation of remembering a single thing. Um, one more thing about um, memory is that instead of thinking about it as a video camera, think about those four stages that have to come together every time you retrieve a memory. So a better way of thinking about memory is not a video camera, is more like Lego. So hopefully, does everyone know what Legos are? Those little plastic bricks. If, you, if they're scattered around your living room, you step on them, they really, really hurt. Uh, you can tell I've got a daughter at home who's very good. Um, so Lego is a better way of thinking about memory because memory is inherently a reconstructive process. Every time you remember something, you're rebuilding it from scratch every single time. So what that means is that memories that you've rebuilt over and over and over again tend to be strong memories. They're memories that come to you easily. And these tend to be the most important things that have happened in our lives. Uh, the birth of children, uh, when we've met a loved one, uh, when we got married, uh, things like that. Things that we think about often tend to be strong memories because we've retrieved them, we've rebuilt them so many times that they endure. The second thing that you need to remember is that even though you can make a memory that's very strong, that rebuilding process makes the memory inherently just a tiny bit unstable. It makes it very malleable. So over a period of years, uh, events change in very fundamental ways. So that something that happened to you in 1973, you might remember clear as a bell but if you took a time machine and went back and compared it against your memory, you might find that it's not quite what you thought it was. Our memories change slowly because they change just a tiny little bit every time we rebuild them. That's the nature of memory. It's this very complex process whereby if we build expertise in a, in a certain memory, we gain uh, an ability to, to have it endure against the ravages of age and of Alzheimer's disease, uh, but it will also have to realize that in making that, those memories strong, they are just a little bit uh, malleable and subject to change. Um, before I move on to showing you where memory is in the brain, uh, frequently people will tell me, oh, my short-term memory is fine, it's my long-term memory that's lousy. Uh, but I want to just define for you 
what short-term memory is versus what long-term memory is. Long-term memory is when I got up here to talk to you. Long-term memory is when I put up this slide. Long-term memory is anything longer ago than 30 seconds. <laughs> anything out of what we call the psychological present, which is just your sensation of being in the moment right now, is already coming from long-term memory. So when Sarah was standing up here introducing me, and if you can recall that, that's already coming from long-term memory. That's not short-term. Short-term memory is only about 15 to 30 seconds. Everything else is long-term memory. So if your short-term memory is lousy and your long-term memory is fine, um, keep in mind that you're basically saying that you don't have a memory for anything longer than 30 seconds. Right? <laughs> I'm guessing that's not what you're trying to say. Uh, so where is memory in the brain? Uh, and what does that even mean? So we've just learned that memory is this reconstructive process. We've learned that memory is more like an assembly process rather than a video camera. So what I've got here is what's called a sagittal view of the brain. So you're looking at the brain uh, from the side, and you're looking at it uh, as though the person is facing uh, to this direction, to your left. Uh, and so the eyes tend to be over here, and the back of the head is over here. And there are four primary lobes of the brain. Um, and so I, because I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, I just focus on the four major lobes of the cerebrum, and I just kind of ignore the rest of the stuff, like the brainstem and the cerebellum, the stuff that keeps your heart beating, it's not really that important. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so the four major lobes of the brain, uh, I'm gonna just give you a quick tour of them before we land on the one that's really involved in memory. So first, at, uh, we've got the frontal lobe, and where might you think that is? It's, a front, it's not a trick question, it's definitely at the front of your head, at least I think so. Um, so the, the frontal lobe is right here, and this is involved uh, in a lot of planning, reasoning, decision making. Anytime it feels like you're really concentrating and focusing, odds are that you're using a great deal of uh, the frontal lobe of the brain. And it's also home to uh, a bit of our personality, and it, it kind of makes us us, in some sense. Uh, the frontal lobe works together with the lobe just behind it, called the parietal lobe, which is kind of up here towards the back of your head. And the parietal lobe does a lot of funny little things, but the favorite thing that I like to talk about is that it's involved in something called sensory integration. And it's something that's so simple and so seamless and so elegant that it's gonna seem weird when I describe it, that this could be a problem. So uh, keep in mind that you're sitting in an audience and you're looking at me and you're hearing me talk. Those are two different modalities that are coming together in perfect harmony seeing me and hearing me. That has to, those signals have to get put together somewhere in your brain. Just like if you're watching a video, sometimes the, uh, the dubbing is out of sync and they're talking and you can't hear anything. That could happen to us and it should happen to us because light tra is transmitted much faster than sound. But the parietal lobe holds the signal from our visual parts of our brain until the audio can catch up and then push them together at just the right time so that you have this unified experience. And because of that, we currently think that the parietal lobe is the seat of conscious awareness, of our feeling of being me, of being I. Uh, my favorite lobe of the brain is called the occipital lobe, uh, and it's in the back of the head. Um, and that's interesting to me because the occipital lobe is primarily involved in vision and seeing. We've dedicated 25% of our brains just to seeing the world around us. And um, maybe someday I'll come back and tell you how amazing our vision is, even if you have to wear glasses like me, even if you're legally blind. Uh, our visual systems are really a modern miracle. Um, but you need a, a quarter of your brain in the back of your head uh, to see the world around you. And I don't know if any of you have known somebody who gets hit really hard on the back of the head and they lose their vision, uh, and that's because there's not, it's not because there's something wrong with their eye, that's because there's something wrong with the brain, the stuff that processes the information that you get from your eyes. Finally, this whitish area of the brain is called the temporal lobe, and it's right next to your ears, so you might think it has something to do with hearing, and it does. It also has something to do with language. But more importantly for today's talk, it's home to three little regions of the brain that are called the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. Those three regions comprise something called the medial temporal lobe. And it's in this part of the brain 
that memories are reassembled. It's in this part of the brain that memories are reconstructed. If you had to pick a part of the brain where memories live, it's right here in the medial temporal lobe. So how do we know that? Uh, how do we, I, I could just make up anything and say, oh, I think it's, it's probably in this part of the brain. Um, we've actually gotten pretty good at imaging uh, the brains of people who are still alive and functioning. And our favorite tool uh, in neuroscience when we, we're dealing with people is using an MRI. So does everybody know what an MRI is? Yes. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't, it's basically uh, like using sonar but with magnets, with electromagnetism, to take pictures of the brain. And you can take very detailed, high-resolution images of human tissue. But more than that, what we can also do is take the pictures of brains um, of people who are different ages. So I'm going to show you a graph, a series of three graphs now. It's going to be a little complex, but I promise I'll walk you through everything. So what we've got here are uh, three more regions of the brain. And what I'm going to show you now is how each of those regions of the brain change with age. The bottom line here is that your brain does not change uniformly as you get older. Some parts get smaller, some parts don't change much at all, and some parts do things that are a little funny. <laughs> so on the left-hand side, we've got, uh, and just across the top actually, we've, we're again looking at a sagittal view, a side view of the brain, but this time the person is looking over here, to your right. On the left-hand side, we've got something called the lateral prefrontal cortex. Now, the lateral prefrontal cortex is right up here in your frontal lobes, but since it's lateral, it's off to the sides. Uh, and it's really involved in a lot of your planning and decision-making, a lot of what we call executive function, uh, complex thinking abilities. And uh, if you look at these graphs, um, as you move from left to right on each of these graphs, you're starting at uh, the age of about 20, and you're moving through to the age of about 90. So left to right, people are getting older. And as you're moving from top to bottom, we're talking uh, about larger regions of the brain to smaller regions of the brain. And so if you look on the left-hand graph here, and again, don't worry too much about the dots, just focus on these black lines. You see that as people are getting older, it's going down. So as people are getting older, the lateral prefrontal cortex, this front part of your brain, is getting smaller. And it's getting smaller at a very steady rate. Now, you may not be very surprised that this is what's happening. Uh, but So that's what's happening in the lateral prefrontal cortex. But let's take a look at another part of the brain. So in the middle, we've got the visual cortex, V1, primary visual cortex. This is where uh, your very early vision centers of the brain are. And as you can see, that black line is a lot shallower. In fact, it's so shallow that as people get older, we're not even sure, statistically speaking, that that region of the brain is shrinking much at all. So while the lateral prefrontal cortex does get smaller as you get older, the area of the primary visual cortex, V1, doesn't seem to be changing much over the course of 70 years. Finally, all the way on the right-hand side, we've got the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus should sound familiar because we just talked about it. The hippocampus is one of those three regions that comprises the medial temporal lobe, and it's one of those parts of the brain that's instrumental in reassembling memories. Now, what you see here is that the line, if you can see the black line, it's a little bendy in the middle. And it's bendy in the middle because it's what we call a curvilinear relationship. That just means that it's not a straight line, it's a little bit curvy. And what that means for the hippocampus is that it starts off very stable. There's not a lot of change at all. But then it kind of falls off a cliff where the change, the decline, gets faster and faster and faster with every decade. So the change that you see from 50 to 60 is smaller than the change that you see from 60 to 70, which is smaller than the change you see from 70 to 80. This is why healthy older adults have memory problems as they get older. There is no part of the brain that is more sensitive to the effects of age than the hippocampus, the parahippocampal formation, and the entorhinal cortex. So this is why, if you find yourself getting forgetful, it doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's disease. This is all the normal part, normal processes that we see with aging. 
your memory is worse because uh, you're probably in this kind of downhill cascade portion of the hippocampus where you're losing a little bit more than you did when you were younger. So you don't have anything to worry about. I will answer questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, we just talked about normal aging. This is what reflects normal aging. Your brain doesn't change all at once. It changes in some places more than others. In, in some places it changes quite drastically, but only when you're um, uh, moving out of middle age. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. That's really the big question. And uh, what I wanted to quickly mention is that of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States um, in the year ending 2013, which are the latest um, data for which uh, the CDC have released statist uh, statistics, um, you see that Alzheimer's disease is number six on this list. But there are two things I want you to keep in mind about this. Alzheimer's disease is number six, but uh, for those of you who carefully peruse the obits and you see that if somebody has Alzheimer's disease, uh, the obits never say they died of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. They always use this curious little expression. They died of complications due to Alzheimer's disease. Now what does that mean? That means that those people, um, those death statistics aren't rolled into this term of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, when somebody dies of complications due to Alzheimer's disease, usually what happens is, uh, in the later stages of the disease, um, they become less mobile and they become more sedentary. And if they uh, have a cough or they get some kind of irritant in their lungs or fluid in their lungs, they're unable to cough it out. And so what happens is they have a respiratory infection, they have pneumonia, they get the flu, and they die that way. And those deaths are recorded in these other categories. Mm -hmm. So Alzheimer's disease is number six, but in fact it's underreported because of complications due to Alzheimer's disease. Point number two is that of the 10 leading causes of death, nine are stable or in decline in terms of their uh, incidence and prevalence in the United States since 1999. There's only one entry on this list that we can't currently uh, treat, prevent, or cure, or even slow down, and that's Alzheimer's disease. So I would say that Alzheimer's disease is, is probably one of the greatest uh, public health threats of our time, uh, but, uh, if that is alarming, just hang on with me to the end of the talk. I've got some really good news for you. Um, but what is Alzheimer's disease? What does that even mean? Uh, this was a question that was very difficult for even researchers to answer for a long time. But I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, what we've got here is uh, what's called a silver stain. This is a blown up picture of some brain cells. And you'll notice that there are four circles on this slide. Uh, there are two that are red, and there are two that are black. The red circles represent something called amyloid. Amyloid plaques, A-beta, A-beta-42, senile plaques. It has a lot of names, but it's all the same thing. Amyloid plaques are uh, a protein, or more accurately a peptide, uh, that misfolds. And it, uh, it, it, it misfolds into what's called an insoluble form, meaning your brain can't clear it out. Now that's a lot of weird, fancy biology terms. So the example that I'd like to give uh, for amyloid uh, plaques is that of saran wrap. So how many of you guys know what saran wrap is? Mm -hmm. Does everybody know? Okay, cling film, it has a lot of different names. Um, and so saran wrap, you know, you, you pull off a sheet, you try to tear it, and you put it over your mashed potatoes so that they're good the next day. Um, and if you're good at it, you just tear off a sheet, and you put, it in, you put it on the stuff, you put it on your bowls, and you're good to go. What happens if you're bad at tearing saran wrap? <laughs> It yeah. sticks together, and you can't tear it apart. You just have this gunk, and what do you have to do with it? You have to throw it away. But what if you couldn't throw it away? What if it was stuck to you? And what if you tried it again, and it crumpled up, and it was stuck to you? What if you tried that again for a day? What if you tried it again for a decade? You would have this buildup of this gunk that you couldn't get rid of, and eventually, it would start to damage your life. It would start to interfere with your daily function. That is exactly what amyloid is doing to your brain. It's this gunk that your brain can't get rid of that builds up over time and eventually leads to widespread neuronal death. Now, five years ago, that would have been the end of the story. I would have said there's some other stuff that happens, but it's really just amyloid. But... Uh, more recently, we've learned that amyloid is not sufficient 
to lead to the dementia that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. We need the black circles too. And the black circles are something called tau, T-A-U, Greek letter tau. And tau uh, is a protein that helps our brain cells keep their shape. It just helps them maintain their structure. But this tau becomes poisoned through a process that we call hypophosphorylation. hypophosphorylation. Uh, and that just means that there's too much phosphate that builds up into this tau, and it weakens the cells from the inside. That opens up uh, the opportunity for amyloid to come in uh, and attack the cell from the outside. So you've got this one-two punch of amyloid and tau that uh, weakens a brain cell and causes it to short circuit and die. And eventually, when that process, that one-two punch, kills off brain cell after brain cell after brain cell, you end up with a stark difference. The brain on the left is a, is a very healthy adult brain. The brain on the right uh, has clinically confirmed Alzheimer's disease. So when you look at these two brains, there's no wonder why somebody with Alzheimer's disease has memory problems. It's no wonder why their personality changes. It's no wonder why they get lost so frequently, why they can't remember where things go, why they can't remember their grandchildren. Because the parts of the brain that are necessary for doing those things are just gone. They've been killed off by that one-two punch of amyloid and tau. And so, just like with aging, Alzheimer's disease does not affect the brain everywhere at once. It starts off in the intermital cortex and moves to the parahippocampal formation and then really takes root in the hippocampus. This is why Alzheimer's disease affects memory. It attacks the same parts of the brain first that are sensitive to age-related decline. And this leads to a bit of a conundrum. If I have memory problems as I get older, and I have memory problems if I have Alzheimer's disease, how the heck am I supposed to know which one is which? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And for the answer to that, we've moved beyond memory as a diagnostic tool for Alzheimer's disease. We've looked uh, for ways to image amyloid directly in the living brain. Now, uh, we've been able to do this as researchers since about 2003, uh, but since 2012, uh, you could go to your doctor and have a very similar scan done uh, to find out if you have amyloid in your brain or not. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It costs a few thousand dollars and is not currently covered by Medicaid mm -hmm. and may not be as informative as you'd like. But, in terms of research, it is very important indeed. So what I'm going to show you now is a little video. Um, there's nothing, there's no audio or anything to worry about here. But, uh, what, what we've got here uh, is a top-down picture of the brain, an axial view, where the top of the image is the front of the brain, the bottom of the image is the back of the brain, and right here in the upper middle are the memory areas of the brain. So that's that medial temporal lobe that we've been talking about so much. Uh, as these colors go from uh, the cooler colors up to the warmer colors of the spectrum, that's referring to more and more amyloid plaques building up in the brain. And for those of you that can see it, it says the estimated time to onset is set at negative 25. Now this is not 25 years before the time of death. This is 25 years before the onset of clinical symptoms. This is 25 years before the time of diagnosis. So as this ticker winds down to zero and then moves beyond it, I want you to see at what point we have what's called a lot of amyloid in the brain. And I'll just submit to you that a lot of amyloid is anything beyond uh, this light blue. So here we go. So now we're about 22 years out, and we see that the colors are starting to warm up. Where else? But in those memory centers of the brain. 10 years out, we have a significant amount of amyloid throughout the whole brain. Wow. And for those of you who are bored looking at the colors, you can see that these black areas uh, represent the blood vessels, the vasculature of the brain. They start to expand as the brain cells die. And uh, well before the time of diagnosis, we've actually maxed out the amount of amyloid we can detect in certain regions of the brain, including those memory areas. So that, at the end of this video, 10 years out, uh, the whole brain is, uh, to put it morbidly, lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> the amount of amyloid that we 
that we see in the brain. So, instead of thinking about memory as the hallmark symptom of Alzheimer's disease, researchers currently think of amyloid as the hallmark symptom. And currently, amyloid start, starts to build up in the brain somewhere between 25 and 30 years before the time of diagnosis. Before the time where you say, hey honey, maybe I should go see someone. So imagine having cancer unchecked for 30 years before you decide to go to the doctor. Imagine having heart disease for 30 years before you do something about it. This is uh, why we've struggled so hard to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, but with these new diagnostic criteria that rely on biomarkers, like amyloid, biomarkers is just a fancy word for biological marker, um, we have a lot more hope. We have 30 years to intervene. And that's exactly what we've started doing. Um, I want to make, take a, just a quick aside to tell you about two things that are commonly mixed up. Uh, one is that people uh, often confuse the terms Alzheimer's disease and dementia. They kind of think of one and the other as, as kind of the same, and you might mix them up, you might use them one way or the other. And actually, clinicians do this all the time, too. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you is that uh, there is a very clear distinction between the two. Alzheimer's disease is a disorder of the brain. Dementia is a disorder of the mind. Now, what do I mean by that? When I talked to you about Alzheimer's disease just now, when I showed you those slides, I just showed you the amyloid in the tau, and the resultant neuronal death. That was Alzheimer's disease. I didn't talk to you about memory problems. I didn't talk to you about aggressive behavior. I didn't talk to you about getting lost. All of those fall under the criteria, uh, fall under the, the domain, rather, of dementia. You can have Alzheimer's disease that results in dementia. When it comes to the memory problems and the changes in behavior that you see, that is all dementia. Now, not all dementias are due to Alzheimer's disease. You can have dementia due to depression, due to alcoholism, due to some other neurodegenerative disease. You can have it uh, due to a lot of different factors. So all dementias are not due to Alzheimer's disease. And similarly, not all cases of Alzheimer's disease present in the same symptoms of dementia. So dementia is a very broad term that just refers to dysfunction. You might think of it as like having a fever. A fever means that something is wrong, but it doesn't tell you what it is. It could be a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So, Alzheimer's disease is a disorder of the brain. Dementia is a disorder of the mind. Um, a quick word on genetics, a very quick word on genetics. Uh, if you're worried about Alzheimer's disease because someone in your family has it, stop. Don't worry. 98.5% of cases of Alzheimer's disease are what we call sporadic AD. It means that you did, not, you did not inherit Alzheimer's disease from your parents. 1.5% of the time, there is, a heritable, like, there is an inherited form of Alzheimer's disease. But my guess is that you would know because uh, more than half of your family would have to have Alzheimer's disease. And it would have to be extremely early onset. So uh, you would have symptoms um, in your, in your, probably in your 30s, so very early on. The rest of us have what's called sporadic, or have a risk for sporadic AD. There are some genes that modify that risk, but it's not a guarantee. So if you have a 1% chance of, uh, of developing Alzheimer's disease, and I say, oh, you've got a gene that's going to increase your risk by four times, then you've got a 4% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. If I told you there was a 4% chance of rain, would you take your umbrella? No. no, almost certainly not. So most of the time, genes and family history of Alzheimer's disease increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease, but they don't guarantee it. So don't worry about genes. Um, there are lots of other things that you can do that may potentially offset the effects of the genes that you've been given. Now, I wanted to get to uh, the really exciting part of my talk. So I've told you all this doom and gloom about Alzheimer's disease, how we can't stop it, how we're all doomed. But we're not. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, all of the things that I'm going to tell you about today are breakthroughs that have happened just this year. 
And the oldest breakthrough, I think, on this list is from March. So this is really just talking about the last um, seven to eight months or so. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is something called scanning ultrasound. Um, that's just a fancy term for like the normal ultrasound that, you, uh, that we all are relatively familiar with. Um, they usually use it on your belly if you're going to have a baby um, to tell you the sex of the baby or if you've got some uh, thoracic cancers uh, or kind of cancers in your chest cavity, they'll do a, you know, uh, an ultrasound there as well. Uh, you can use that same technology to cure Alzheimer's disease. Did you know that? No. Let me, so I'm going to tell you how it works. This picture is kind of a, a blown up schematic of that process. Um, but essentially what you can do is you can use the ultrasound technology to open up something called the blood-brain barrier. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's a barrier that exists between your blood system and your brain system uh, to, to, to kind of keep them separate. It's the reason why you don't die every time you get sick. It's the reason why you don't have hallucinations every time you've got a cold. Uh, because there is a firewall between your brain system and your bloodstream. This is also why it's so hard to come up with a blood test for AD. Because these systems are pretty separate. Um, so you can open up a gateway between these systems, and it doesn't damage the body or the brain. What it does is that it allows certain parts of your bloodstream, of your blood system, to come through the brain and clear out the amyloid. And these are little, um, these are, uh, they're called lysosomes. And I, I, the way that I like to talk about them is they're like the all-star garbage bin of the body. So if, you know, if there's, if it's like on garbage day, if you sort of hopefully put out a couch or a television, they're like the garbage men who will come and like throw that thing in the back of the truck. They will come and take it away when no one else would. So the lysosomes come through the brain and they bind to that insoluble amyloid, all that saran wrap that you can't get rid of, and they break it down and they clear it out. And what they've done is they've found that if you apply this ultrasound technology, uh, you can clear out up to 75% of the amyloid plaques that are in the brain. Wow. And in addition to that, you regain all of your uh, thinking and memory abilities. It all comes back. Here's the rub. This was done in 10 rats. Only 10 rats, not even 11. Uh, so we're a long way off from doing this in humans. But since the study came out in March, and since I've been talking about this study, there have been um, at least three or four other research groups that have looked at modifying the blood-brain barrier in really creative ways. Now, some of you might have heard about this in the news because they're using the same technology to cure cancer because it is a really great way of performing what's called precision medicine. And so you can uh, put some little tiny medicine in bubbles that will float across this blood-brain barrier and pop on the other side and will treat the cancer. Similarly, you can put a little bit of Alzheimer's medicine and these little bubbles, float them across the blood-brain barrier, and they'll pop, and they will treat the Alzheimer's disease. So what's nice about this is that um, you can do it without drugs, and it seems to work. You can also do it with drugs, but with far fewer side effects than with traditional medicine methods. So this is a very promising technology that I think um, will be good, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but all sorts of intractable diseases and disorders that we've struggled to, to work with. Um, here's something that hits a little bit closer to home. The Mediterranean diet, the MIND diet. How many of you have heard of this in some way, shape, or form? Turns out that it's not a scam. It's actually something that works. The Mediterranean diet, which is consisted of lots of things that you see here, so dark leafy greens, fruits and vegetables, berries, nuts, a little bit of wine, a little bit of chocolate, so that's good too. Um, if you strictly adhere to the Mediterranean diet for a four and a half year period, uh, there was a study that released that showed that your risk of out developing Alzheimer's disease was cut by 57% over a five year, not even a five year period. And my favorite statistic is that you don't even have to be good at the diet to get the benefit. For individuals who uh, engage in what was called moderate adherence, which means they had like a little bit of barbecue, they had you know, a few burgers, um, they had you know, some extra butter on their pancakes, uh, you still saw a one-third ri um, risk reduction in Alzheimer's disease. So the Mediterranean diet, combined with a low-sodium diet approach, really seems to be effective in lowering your risk, slowing the rate of cognitive decline, and potentially offsetting some of the worst of Alzheimer's disease. So um, 
it's, I mean, it, it, for a lot of us, it would be a really big change in our everyday diets. And uh, I would say that the more you can, the closer you can get to something like this, um, the better off you'll be. Truly, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is a really complicated concept, as you can see by this graph that I'm not going to even begin to try to explain, um, mainly because I don't understand it either, um, is, is this field called epigenomics. Now, we all are sort of familiar with genetics, right? So genetics scales up into something called genomics. So genomics refers to all of the genes put together in your body. So you form a human genome. So if you remember, you're hearing about the Human Genome Project like 15 years ago, it's mapping out all of the genes in the body. Now, because we've done that, we have unprecedented access to understanding how our body codes these genes. So then you get into something called epigenetics, which looks at how the genes in your body turn on and off. And that's something that I don't, maybe a lot of you didn't know, that your genes aren't sort of hardwired from when you're born. They turn on and off based on your environment. Now, you can scale up from epigenetics to epigenomics, which means you're looking at whole uh, classes of genes that turn on and off um, relative to the environment around you. So we're not talking about individual genes here. We're talking usually about um, you know, a couple, uh, maybe a few thousand, maybe a few tens of thousands of genes. And what we've learned is that there are a few tens of thousands of genes that tend to switch on and a few tens of thousands of genes that tend to switch off um, right before you get Alzheimer's disease. And these genes affect the way that Alzheimer's disease spread throughout your brain. And ultimately, it looks like a lot of these genes are related to your inflammatory response in your body. So current thinking, and this stuff is very, very new. Um, some of the research that I'm talking about was really seriously published just last week. Uh, and the first study on the epigenomics of, of Alzheimer's disease uh, was talked about in a symposium back in February. So this is brand new stuff. And so I don't have a lot to tell you right now because we're still figuring it out. Um, uh, but what we sort of are starting to think here is that there are many thousands of genes that turn on and off uh, in response to our basic inflammatory response. And if that goes awry, then these genes get switched on or switched off, whatever they're not supposed to be doing, and that makes the Alzheimer's uh, process start. So the jury's still out on that, but it may be that this epigenomic uh, field of study gives us the answer that we need, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for Parkinson's, for diabetes, for heart disease, for depression, for schizophrenia, for frontotemporal dementia, for Lewy body disease, anything that you can name mm -hmm. may be tied to this epigenomic sequence that gets switched on and off. And it happens very, very rapidly. Um, your genes get switched on and off with the seasons. There was a study that came out in April that showed that some of these genes uh, turn on in the winter time to protect you uh, when you get a cold. So imagine that your genes, your actual genes that are hardwired in your system, switch on in December and switch off again in April. So this is a really exciting new area of research, and hopefully if I come back in a year, I'll have a lot more to tell you. Um, so I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions, um, but I hope that I've given you a little bit of hope today, and uh, during the question and answer period, maybe I'll tell you about uh, some things that are a little bit closer to home some cures that are uh, closer to uh, being fully realized. But for now, thanks so much for your attention. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, last year, uh, my doctor thought it might be a good idea to try one of these new tablets. Uh, I think it was called Oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I could only take it one day. I woke up in the middle of the night, and my mind wouldn't shut off. It was racing here and here and here and here. So I called the next day and said, I don't think I can take that. But would there be something, some other uh, tablet like that that they agree with me? So um, the question was, uh, this woman here took uh, oxybutyn, was it? Uh, and 
Um, her doctor recommended it for her, but she took it for one day, and it just doesn't seem, it didn't seem to be a good fit. Uh, she couldn't shut her mind off. Uh, so the question is, is there something else that you can take? Um, the answer is actually on this next slide. Uh, there's currently no cure or treatment for Alzheimer's disease, but if you notice, there's a little star right there. Um, that asterisk means that uh, ongoing clinical trials are testing possible cures, and every week there is a new clinical trial and a new sense of hope for Alzheimer's disease. So these aren't publicly available yet. They haven't been approved by the FDA, but a lot of them are what's called phase three clinical trials, which is the last stage before FDA approval. So the drug has already been tested, it's already been found to be safe, it's already been found to be at least moderately effective, and not too many side effects, and now they're being tested very broadly. So clinical trials, um, I, I would say, are probably your best bet for a real uh, treatment, a really something that could potentially be effective. And I don't want you just to think that I'm just saying some of these things. Um, they've started to release results from very early clinical trials, um, starting back in July of this year, and uh, it seems that in individuals who already have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, giving them a drug that binds to that amyloid plaque and clears it out of the brain seems to slow the rate of cognitive decline by about a third. So what I'm saying here is that, remember when I said there was only one disease, uh, that, uh, that there was only one cause of death on that list of 10 that we couldn't slow, treat, or prevent? That's actually not quite so true anymore. We're actually living in a world where we can finally slow the process of Alzheimer's disease. And the hope is that if we start 25 or 30 years earlier, we can fully stop the disease from ever uh, really affecting people. So um, that's, that's the advice that I would give you. Maybe can talk with your doctor about enrolling in a clinical trial. Um, but that said, there has not been a new drug approved for Alzheimer's disease since 2003. So anything that you've heard on the news lately about a new drug for Alzheimer's disease that's just been approved is just a remix of the old stuff. Um, we've, tried, we've now learned that we can combine some of the old stuff in a new way. But there hasn't been a new drug in, in over 12 years. And that's because we're really putting all of our money into these prevention trials. Um, the current drugs on the market do not actually affect the Alzheimer's disease process at all. They don't affect the amyloid, they don't affect the tau, they just help you feel better and get through your day. It's like taking a cold medicine. It's not gonna cure the cold, but it will make you feel better. The current class of drugs on the market help your brain uh, think better. It sort of clears away the fog, but it doesn't change the underlying disease process. And so these drugs will stop working after about a year or so. Um, so I would say that if you want something that is likely to be lasting, uh, even if you don't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, especially if you don't, um, clinical trials are probably your best bet. Yes, ma'am. Going along with her question, your answer had to do with symptoms. But on the PET scans they show on TV, when they show an Alzheimer's brain, they actually show shrinkage of the brain in a particular area. Mm -hmm. If you come up with something that would, say, improve a third of the symptoms of memory loss and all that, what would, is there any way, we know now that brain cells regenerate. Since late 90s, that's mm -hmm. common knowledge in the medical community. So is there a way to unshrink a shrinking, a brain that's already shrunk, is there a way to re reconstitute. reconstitute the brain? So yeah, that's a great question. The question is, um, you know, if you could stop the Alzheimer's process, you still have a lot of dead brain cells. You still have a lot of atrophy, uh, of these regions of the brain that are smaller. Um, but she, the comment was that we know something, which is that the brain regrows new cells all the way into older adulthood. The problem is scale. The rate at which we form new brain cells is vastly outstripped by the Alzheimer's disease process, which is why it's more and more critical that we intervene as early as possible. Now, the current crop of clinical trials that are testing out, that are potentially curing Alzheimer's disease, do not feature a component uh, of, that uh, regenerates lost brain cells. That's probably about eight to 10 years out at this point, but those are coming down the pipeline. So we're going to try to figure out if we can stop the disease process first, and then we're going to move on to a class of drugs that will potentially reverse the effects of the disease. But um, so those aren't available yet, but they're but they're coming. But yes, sir. Are there have there been any correlations shown between traumatic brain injury and eventual Alzheimer's development? Um, yes and no. So the question is. Uh, 
is there a correlation between traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease? Uh, the sad news is that if you have traumatic brain injury, or even if you have repeated concussions, like football players, um, you weaken the brain to all sorts of diseases. Um, and that one of those diseases is Alzheimer's disease. So individuals who um, have traumatic brain injury, individuals who have lots of concussions, uh, tend to be more susceptible to the effects of Alzheimer's disease. That said, there is uh, a whole class of dementias, because remember, dementia just refers to problems in your thinking and memory abilities. Um, there's a whole class of dementias that are directly related to traumatic brain injury or repeated concussions. So if you have head injury, it does make you more sensitive to these things. That said, there are things that you can do um, that make you less sensitive to the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so things like diet and exercise, things like social engagement and intellectual engagement. So don't do, don't do Sudoku, don't do Lumosity. Actually engage with the world around you. Talk to people. Do things like this. Um, they're cheaper, they're a lot more fun, and they are a lot more effective um, at uh, keeping Alzheimer's at bay. Yes, ma'am. Going along that same thing with brain injury trauma, uh, seizures. So, as far as I'm aware, there's not a strong link between seizures and Alzheimer's disease. But if you think about what I was telling you uh, about that one two punch of amyloid and tau and how they kill the brain cell, I said that the brain cell does a funny little thing it short circuits which is uh, essentially a very small version of a seizure. So there's actually a current um, class of drugs uh, for individuals who have mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease uh, that are reconstituted anti-epileptic therapies. Uh, because basically if you stop the brain from having these tiny little seizures, then the brain cells won't die. Um, so the hope is that by repurposing these anti-epileptic drugs, you might be able to save the brain from having uh, the worst of Alzheimer's disease. Now, as far as a direct link is concerned, I don't think there's a strong one, uh, but it is using, it's basically trying to control the same, like a, a very small scale version of that same process. Uh, yes, ma'am. I've always thought and worried about what I call my retrieval system. Okay. And um, I know it's up there, but the older I get, it's harder to get it back. And so sometimes I just use this little thing and go, take it. And then I relax and I wait. And maybe, you know, a couple hours later, it's like going, it pops up. It, whatever I wanted to know kind of pops up. And uh, I think, well, why can't I just get it immediately? And then I decided, well, maybe it's because, you know, we talked about individuality and all this keen on that. that all of us are made differently, and mm -hmm. I, I pat myself and say, I just filled mine to capacity. <laughs> and and, and there, you know, there's, there, there's not any more room for the new stuff. Mm -hmm. And what is new as you get older, this is the other little facet of that, is as you get older, you lead these routine lives where Wednesday is not much different from Thursday, is not much different from Friday, and so then it becomes harder to distinguish what did I do on Wednesday that I didn't do on Thursday that I didn't do on Friday. And so, to my mind, it's not so much a physical, it may be the physical part of the capacity up there, but also your life is reflected in what your brain is taking in each day and makes for memory to be a lot more difficult. Well, so actually, so that's a fantastic comment. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I just want to unpack a little bit about what you said because there's so much there that, that's really great. Uh, so uh, you started off by saying that sometimes you struggle to, to re like remember something and then you just say, you know what, forget it. I'm going to just relax and let it go and then it comes to you a little while later. And that's because what you're, you're, you found a really great way of getting around the biggest problem that plagues us uh, when we have memory failures. And that is something called perseveration. So when you perseverate at something, it means you start doing the same thing over and over and over again. And when we have these memory failures, we try to retrieve that memory in the same failed way 
over and over and over again. Now, when you have this moment where you say, take it, let it go, you relax. But not really, because your brain is still tinkering away, still trying to find a way around it. And when you relax, you, instead of saying, I'm going to keep trying that same failed pathway, your brain gets creative. And it starts to find out like, ways around it. And then what eventually it does is it hits on something that works, and you retrieve the memory. Now, it, that only happens because you relax and you allow your brain to do its thing. So that's a really tremendous method, and I would actually recommend that for anybody who struggles to remember things. Um, so instead of getting frustrated at the moment, just let it go. And uh, if it comes to you, then you know, that's great. If it doesn't, then maybe it's not that big of a deal. But odds are that it's more likely to come to you if you let it go than if you, uh, than if you keep trying to retrieve the, the wrong thing. Now, um, and it's, there's so much that you said that was really great that I want to get to, but we don't quite have the time. But I will say, uh, the, the other thing that you said was that sometimes you feel like your brain is filled to capacity. One thing that we've learned is that the human brain is really capable of storing many hundreds years worth of memories. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's a funny thing that it, sometimes it feels like our brains are overflowing. Uh, but in reality, our brain is such a dynamic and rich and capacious organ um, that we could live to be two or three hundred years old and still not run out of space, in essence. So mm -hmm. it's really kind of the way that we're, that we're using it. Uh, but like you said, um, when Wednesday is the same as Thursday is the same as Friday, we don't have days that are distinct. And so of course you're not going to remember what you did because it was exactly the same thing. We want memories that are distinct. And you can get that by doing things like being socially engaged. Um, by uh, trying to avoid loneliness where possible, uh, by trying a varied diet. By introducing this variety in your life, you're making things more distinct and easier to remember, but you're also creating a process by which your body can support you um, as you get older. So you've said a lot of really wonderful things, so thank you for, for that comment. So, um, yes, ma'am? Um. So many questions and I can't remember any of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All along the way I had questions. So just to clarify, there is a way to diagnose Alzheimer's before the person dies, but it costs thousands of dollars to have that scan. That's a sin, right? Okay. Well, so um, so the, the answer is, is always, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, the scan will not definitively tell you whether you have Alzheimer's disease or not. And that's because the current diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease, um, the only way to be 100% sure is still at autopsy. Okay. Now, the scans get us closer than ever, but I will say that paper and pencil tests, interviews, and a lot of other things get us pretty darn close. Okay. We are about 97% accurate at diagnosing Alzheimer's disease without that scan. That scan might buy us another one or two percent. So it's not, it's not that, you don't need to spend those thousands of dollars. You just need to find a good neurologist. Okay. Number two, Alzheimer's disease, you can die from just Alzheimer's disease? That it is, is possible, but relatively rare. So okay. the question is, can you actually die of Alzheimer's disease? Now, um, remember those parts of the brain that I said don't matter? Uh, the, <laughs> the brain stem and the cerebellum that are involved in uh, you know, you're maintaining your heartbeat, your breathing, your respiratory system, um, uh, your swallowing behavior when you eat. Um, eventually, if you have Alzheimer's disease long enough, it starts to affect those systems. And um, that's, that's what will kill you in the end. So Alzheimer's can be very much be a deadly disease. Okay. And I'm so sorry, I'm going to, just in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, so the woman just behind you in the green shirt, yes. Uh, yes, you went, uh, said something at the end of your talk about Lewy body disease. Yes. And, uh, and uh, I had just found, found out about that a couple of days ago. My brother is, has a form of dementia, but... He's got DLB, dementia uh, of the Lewy Well, body. he's in an Alzheimer's unit, and mm -hmm. they have him there. He doesn't have Alzheimer's, but... And he remembers things very well, but uh, at times. But he will also go back, he'll have an episode He'll be good for four or five days, and then he'll have an episode where he'll take his hands and clasp them together, and he'll go like this as if he's drinking a cup of coffee or something, and it's difficult for me to talk to him or get his attention, although he will turn to me and mm -hmm. talk to me. And uh, it will last for a little while, but he doesn't have it continually. 
Right. Now, when he first was sent to the doctors because of uh, what was going on with him at some point in time, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. That's but very common. They weren't very sure of that right. at all, and they gave him some medicine for that, which over time made him deathly sick, so yes. sick that he took himself off of it, and then when he went to the yeah. doctors, he explained why he did that and uh, how sick he was. And the doctor said, well, it's like if you have cancer and you're having treatments that are doing you more harm than good, then there's no point in, in taking that and doing that anymore. Right. So they, he took him off of that. But what the doctor discovered early on was the fact that he had narrowing of the small arteries in his hip. Mm -hmm. That was the first day. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I see him all the time, and I take him out for rides, and he's very uh, attentive, and he remembers things. But it's this back and forth thing with the episode that's very sad to right. see. Right. So um, I just want to. So the, the, I'll, I'll try to answer some of that. So the the question is about dementia of the Lewy body, uh, and so what's tricky about DLB is that it has what's called a mixed presentation, uh, and so it, it has things that overlap with vascular dementia with Parkinson's disease and with Alzheimer's disease. So if you, if you have um, a doctor who's trying to, who only sees like a snapshot of those symptoms, they're gonna make a snap judgment that it's one of those three. But then it's gonna be sort of a low confidence decision. They'll be like, it seems like Parkinson's, but it's kind of weird. Uh, and so usually that's what happens with um, dementia of the Lewy body. And when you take the medicines, you're kind of in a catch-22 situation. So if you take uh, medicines for the Parkinsonism, so uh, maybe some kind of movement troubles, uh, you make the cognitive symptoms worse. And if you take medicine, if you take uh, like an Aricept or Nervenda uh, for the cognitive symptoms, you often make the movement disorder worse uh, in that's many cases. Happened, so right. Exactly so happened. it's it's sort of like in this sweet, in this kind of this no man's land where there's the current crop of drugs that are available that can treat Parkinson's, that, are there, that can help with Parkinson's, or that can help with Alzheimer's disease, are of limited utility uh, with the dementia of the Lewy body. So, uh, it, uh, unfortunately, some people do respond to a blend of treatments, like you have to find like the right proportions of things uh, that work, but you, you need a, really, a very skilled doctor to, to make that work. He wants to come home. And right, he can't but it's it's a very it's a very difficult disease. And he, he does the balance thing. It's not good with him, so. Right. Yeah. I'm so Pretty sorry sad. to hear that. It's um, it's a struggle, but uh, there there are some promising treatments. They're they're a little bit longer off than uh, than Alzheimer's disease, uh, because DLB is comparatively rare. Uh, but there are lots of people that are that are really looking for that. Is there any way I can see? If, he can get uh, if you come up to me after the talk, I'll, I'll tell you about a few resources that you can check out. I think we've probably time for one more yeah. question. Uh, the Lady in the Polka Dots. <laughs> I wonder if you had done any research on a person who, as a result of a stroke, has aphasia. Um, I have not done any research in that regard, but um, strokes that result in aphasia are fairly common. Um, my, my grandmother, I think three years ago, had a stroke that resulted in um, some aphasia, and she's battled back over the, the past few years and regained a lot of her function. Um, that is a really a best case scenario, and is not, it's not terribly common, unfortunately. Is there, so, any, is there any place that does help a person who has aphasia? Uh, so usually you'll have to go through some kind of rehabilitative clinic uh, to, to get treatment with that. Um, so that's a little bit area outside of my area of expertise because I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a research doctor. Uh, but I have a feeling that, um, that Sarah could probably refer you to some potential options. But the, so there are things that you can do. Unfortunately, when you have a stroke, uh, basically it's, it's like a heart attack of the brain, like a, like a blood vessel has leaked or exploded and killed off a bunch of brain cells. Uh, so there's, there's not really any coming back from that. Uh, what you can do is you can sort of retrain your brain uh, through very careful uh, rehabilitation. It's really intense and it's really difficult. Um, but, and you don't always come back 100% of the way, but you can come back, say, 50 or 60% with, uh, with a lot of hard work. All right, I'm going to stick around to answer a few more questions, so if I didn't get to you. Um, Would you mind doing me a favor and sure. just sharing with the group your experience in New Zealand and how you got involved in this? 
Okay, uh, so Sarah has seen this talk, uh, I think, maybe 15 times. And so, uh, a few weeks ago, somebody asked me why I study Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think they were probably expecting sort of a standard answer. Oh, I've got a grandparent who had Alzheimer's disease. It was really heartbreaking. Um, my grandfather does have Alzheimer's disease, uh, but he wasn't diagnosed until I was halfway through graduate school. Um, so when I was uh, 20 years old, um, I studied abroad in New Zealand, because of course it's gorgeous, it's New Zealand. Um, and so I spent, uh, I spent uh, not a lot of time in class, if I'm honest. Um, because again, it was New Zealand. If, you, if you've ever been there, if you've ever seen pictures of it, why would you go to spend time in class? Um, and uh, I went to, uh, I signed up for a bunch of classes on neuroscience, and I took a class on neurodegeneration, um, I really was not exactly a model student. If I wasn't skipping class uh, and going on hiking, then I was probably asleep in class because uh, of all of the adventuring that I was doing. Um, but one day, um, and I'll never forget it because this was uh, mid-July uh, 2005, I, um, we covered like specific neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, my professor actually flashed up a picture uh, that looks very much uh, like this one. In fact, it was this picture. Um, and I just sort of had one of those lightning bolt moments that you hear about, that you see in movies, that you never think could actually happen to you. And uh, I felt that there's really no greater injustice in the world than making it 70 or 80 years through everything this planet is thrown at you, and losing the one thing that is more important than every other. It's like your sense of self, your memory, of everything that you've had, like those are the real treasures. Those are the things that are more valuable than, than the money, than, than, than anything else, than the size of the house you have, or the car you drive. You just want to remember a life well lived. And it just seems to be just horrible that there's a disease that can come and take that away from you, and take that away from your family. Uh, and so every time I look at this, it's sort of a reminder of why I do what I do, um, so that someday soon, um, we won't have to deal with this anymore. So that's, that's why I study what I study. Right, thank you.